Acts. And for me, I'm, I'm going through Acts just personally. And and I stumbled across this passage and it just, it, 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 it hit me so hard. I just had to kind of stop and ponder about this and wonder about this and kind of soak this in. But Paul in Acts 20, so if you guys want to turn there in your Bibles to Acts 20, uh, it's Acts 20 starting in verse 22. This is nearing the end of, of Paul's uh, ministry. This is nearing the end of, of his freedom to be able to travel to this city, to that town, and preach the gospel to, to anybody and everybody. Um, this is nearing the end of his ministry. And, uh, and, and he is determined to go to Jerusalem, which would inevitably lead him to going to Rome. And he would be essentially in house arrest and finishing his days in Rome. Um, but before he goes around, before he goes to Jerusalem, he just felt this urge from the Holy Spirit to go there. And so this is where we're going to pick up this morning with the idea, with the topic in mind of you are here because God's given you an assignment. You have a God-given purpose and a God-given assignment to be here. Acts 20 verse 22, Paul says this, and now behold, I am going to Jerusalem constrained by the spirit, like literally like bound by the spirit, like compelled by the spirit. The Holy Spirit has put so heavy on Paul's heart, the need to go to Jerusalem that Paul feels like he doesn't even have a choice. Like he is utterly convinced, constrained, compelled by the spirit. It's time to go to Jerusalem and knowing what will happen to me there, except uh, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and affliction await me. Like that is all Paul has to really go off of is this feeling that imprisonment and affliction awaits him. And yet despite the inevitable um, outcome of imprisonment and affliction, Paul knows he doesn't even have a choice because it is so heavy on his heart to go to Jerusalem. Verse 24, but I do not account my life of any value, nor as precious to myself, if only I may finish my course. Paul, Paul's saying like, man, it, if I choose to live for me, like what, what purpose is that? What value is that? What values, is, is it really worth me being here if it's, I'm just going to focus on me. It's like, no, no, I, I, I don't account my life of any value as precious to myself. Like, I don't, I'm not here just for me. If only I may finish my course, if only I may finish my assignment and the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. Paul is determined to finish the course. Paul is determined to finish his assignment. He knows that he's been given a purpose and an assignment from God. And even if affliction and even if imprisonment and even if hardship and even if being misunderstood and even in the mockery and even in the beating and even though those things are inevitable, Paul is determined. This just reminds me of, of when Jesus, he set his face on Jerusalem. Jesus was determined to go to, to Jerusalem to suffer, die, and raise again. But I just I love this determination as I was reading through through this passage as I'm going through Acts. And the, and the reality is you, you have an assignment from God. And I just want to encourage you to be determined to walk out every step, every day of your life with purpose because you are here on purpose. You are here on assignment. And, uh, and I even go back to when Mordecai was encouraging Esther. Esther found herself in such a peculiar position, uh, being queen when, when like that just didn't even make sense. But God was orchestrating and moving and opening doors. And all of a sudden, she has this platform. She's been given this, this position of queen. And she has the opportunity to actually save her people because of her close proximity and her relationship and her connection with the king. She has an opportunity to save her people. And by saving her people, inevitably, what that would do is that that would, that would save the bloodline. That would save her people 
down the road and down the generations, eventually securing the opportunity for the Savior to be born in the bloodline of 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 his you know Israel ancestors and and I love that because Esther had a part to play in preserving the opportunity for the savior to be born as an Israelite for the savior to be born uh of being a Hebrew and so what Esther did was so powerful as she preserved her people saved her people but when she was resting like I don't really know like I have to stand up to the king I have to raise my voice I have to make a stand and normally that would exalt and 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 in death like no one stands up to the king the, the king does as the king wishes to do and so she was in her she was in a, a real place of tension of uncertainty and mordecai challenges and encourages esther saying who knows if perhaps you were made queen for such a time as this and, and again this just echoes true down the generations to all the way to where we are in 2020 <laughs> Here in April of 2020, you are here for such a time as this. And I don't know what, I don't, I don't know why, and I don't know how it's going to look, but I do know that you are here on purpose. You have an assignment from God and that you are here for such a time as this. This has been a, a statement that God has continually put on my heart to reassure me um, that, that this is all going to be okay. That this this weird time, this pandemic, this uh, this chaos, this panic, this the protocols of social distancing, and being unable to gather physically together as a church, uh, for me, I'm just like God. What's happening? Like literally, I, I was able to preach four weeks live as a brand new lead pastor, and then all of a sudden, everything as you know, everything that we know it to be <laughs> changes. We were unable to meet together physically. Um, I felt a little bit momentum and like, whoo, yeah, you know? Uh, and then all of a sudden it's like, sweet. Now everything's restricted to basically phone calls, Zoom meetings, Facebook live, etc. cetera. Um, what is happening? Um, you know, did I hear from God right? You know, this is a weird way to start out a new pastorate is <laughs> to start out a new pastorate in a pandemic. <laughs> um, but God has continually to, you know, reassured me like, man, um, I made you for such a time as this. Uh, I, I've, I've decided that you are here today for such a time as this. In the middle of this pandemic, you, you, you I've given you an assignment. And I just want to encourage you, like, you are here for such a time as this. Even in the midst of this crazy uh, trial, even in the midst of this um, pandemic, even in the midst of some of these hardships of, of life and like, I don't know what life's going to look like now. Um, you were made to be here on purpose for such a time as this. I even think if we go back even uh, again to the Old Testament and Job, um, I, I love even the idea of we carry the breath of God and how there's there's purpose even carrying his breath. Um, listen to this in Job 34 verses 14 through 15. This is This is so crazy. I mean, this is nearing the end of Job and, uh, you know, and, and, and amidst all of his trial and all of his hardship and just being stripped down from all of his uh, comforts and everything that he used to be able to depend on and all of his riches and all of his blessings and all of his health and all of his love, like being stripped of so much, um, he inevitably, he has nowhere else to look except to look up at the power and the glory and the goodness of God. And anyway, so this is, um, this is just part of the story of like looking to God and seeing how great he is. Um, we read in, in, in verse uh, 14 and 15 of, of Job 34. Uh, if he, he is God, so talking about God. If he should set his heart to it and gather to himself his spirit and his breath, like the spirit of man, which is his breath. You guys remember that when God formed Adam, he actually breathed into Adam's nostrils the breath of life. So from God's breath, we have this, this spirit of man, this, this, this life that comes from God, that comes from his breath. So verse 14, I'm going to say it again. If, we should, if he should set his heart to it and gather to himself his spirit and his breath, and all flesh would perish together, and man would return to dust. So you just look at that picture like, 
if God right now chose to gather to back to himself the breath that he's allowed us to borrow, the life as we know it would return back to him and we would return to dust. Which, which leads me to this thought. If you woke up this morning and you took a breath, that breath is a borrowed breath from God. Today, you are alive. You are breathing. You woke up. You probably had a cup of coffee or like me, I've had two cups of coffee. You have the breath of God. You have the spirit, the life, the breath of God in you. You are here on borrowed time, on his breath. And if he chooses that his breath that is in you, it is time for that breath to come back to him, then that means that you are going back to him, that your days on this earth is done. Which leads me to, to say this. If you're breathing today, you are here for a purpose. That as long as you have his breath in you, you are here for a purpose. You are here because he's given you an assignment. You are here because you are made for such a time as this. That every breath that you breathe is a gift from God. That every step that you take is a step that God allows. That you have his breath in your lungs. And with your breath in and your breath out, may we praise God because that's that's his breath in you anyway. You're living on borrowed time. I, and, and I... And I know that like we, we want to accumulate status. We want to accumulate power. We want to, we want to make a name for ourselves. We want a certain reputation. We, we want to work hard. We want, we want to retire. We're building up that 401k. We want to, right? And it's like all about us. But the thing is, it's not about you. That even your life is a borrowed breath of God. You are here on purpose. You are here for something way greater than just yourself. You're here because you have purpose. You have his breath in your lungs. You have, as Paul said in Acts 20, you have a course ahead of you. You have a, an assignment from God. I love even, you know, Jesus's declaration uh, recorded in John 17, verse four. Jesus said, I glorified you on the earth, having accomplished the work which you have given me to do. Jesus knew his, his assignment. He came to seek and to save the lost, to give his life as a ransom for many. And he did not let anything deter him away from that because he was determined to fulfill his assignment. And here at the end of his life, at the end of his ministry, Jesus says, hey, I, I've glorified you, dad. I've accomplished the work you've given for me to do. Like I'm running the race and I see the finish line. And even when Jesus was on the cross, for about six hours, he who knew no sin became our sin. Jesus became our sin, became our brokenness. He entered into the depths of our weakness, into the depths of our fragility. Fragility. Uh, he he entered to the depths of our of our sinfulness because he came became our sin. He entered into death. But right before he died, Jesus said this: "It is finished." That the course that was ahead of Jesus, he finished that the assignment that God gave him was complete. Jesus said, it is finished. I've paid the price of the wages of sin. I have borne everybody's sin. I became sin so that I could set the captives free, so that there is eternal forever forgiveness for anybody and everybody that would just step into, accept, embrace through faith this reality that it is finished, that people don't have to atone for their sin, that I've atoned for their sin, that I've purified them, that I've washed them clean, that I've taken their sin, that I've given them forgiveness, that I've set them free. It is finished. And Jesus, upon saying it is finished, in Luke, we read that Jesus said with a loud voice, into your hands, I commit my spirit. Like that's, that's Job language, right? What we just read in Job 34, that if God were, would collect his spirit, his breath, then we would return to dust. Jesus, at the end of finishing his life, his assignment, he says, hey, have my spirit, have the breath that you've given me 
because I'm fully man, right? Jesus was fully man. So have this breath, dad, have the breath back, have the spirit back because my, my days are done. I finished the assignment. So we find ourselves in kind of a, a time full of trial and a time full of discomfort and a time full of unknown and a time full of uncertainty. And really for the American church, um, we've been pretty comfortable. Um, when we read passages of trials and tribulations and persecution, I think that's just one thing that the American church, the 21st century, the Western viewpoint, the Western lens, um, the Western lifestyle, that's a hard concept to really relate to. Because when Paul was writing these epistles, especially you even look at the author of Hebrew, of, of Hebrews, and, and he was writing to the Hebrew people saying, don't give up. I know your businesses are shutting down because you believe in Jesus. I know that people are literally being crucified. I know that people are literally being torched on fire. Like I know people are literally dying. I know you are seeing your neighbors disappear. Like I know there's so much trial and hardship, but, but hang in there. And, and the person who wrote Hebrews, I mean, that, that's a solid example. I even look at, uh, you know, James 1.12. <laughs> James 1.12 says, Blessed is a man who perseveres under trial. For once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. And even in, even in Revelation, those of us who've received any sort of crown, what do we do with our crowns? <laughs> we will lay our crowns at the feet of Jesus because he deserves it all. And so whatever crown, crown of life that, we've, that we will get, we'll just lay it down again at the feet of Jesus. And I just want to encourage you that whatever trial, whatever tribulation, wherever you're at right now, and, and whatever has warranted or merited your attention to stress about something or to worry about something, I just want to encourage you to persevere, to persevere if there's any sort of stress or worry, trial or tribulation. Persecure and know that you are here on purpose. You are here on an assignment from God and that he will supply your every need. That's a promise. And you will be able to run the race that he's called you to run, to finish what he's called you to do. Because you are here on purpose. And if he's called you to something, he will equip you to what he's called you to do. And so as this time of remembering that we're, on, we're here on purpose, I, I, I just want to encourage you that, that you are the wife to your spouse for a reason. Men, you are the husband to your spouse for a reason. You are the parents to, to your children for a reason. That today, here in April of 2020, you are here for a reason. You are surrounded by neighbors, physical neighbors, during the time where we're all home. We're all in our neighborhoods. You are in the neighborhood. You have certain neighbors for a reason. I, I don't want to go through this day thinking, well, it's just another day. No, this is a gift from God that we're, that we're alive, that we're awake, that we're breathing, that we're here. And that as long as we're here, there's something that God has called us to do. <laughs> the moment our task is done, the moment our assignment is done, sweet, we're going to return back to God. It's going to be awesome. Uh, but let's live with a sense of urgency and a, and a sense of intentionality, knowing our assignment. Let's pray.